Good evening, my name is Paul Walker. Uh, I'm with uh, Green Cross International, as I know a good number of you in the audience know full well. Um, I'd just like to uh, welcome you all here and uh, briefly uh, introduce the panel. We have, we're have we actually very fortunate to have such a really expert panel on Syria and chemical weapons. Um, I was coming here this, this, uh, this past week and this weekend and felt that there's been very little discussion, as far as I know, beyond the political negotiations here, uh, obviously around the Syrian crisis and civil war, uh, around the uh, chemical demilitarization program, but we've had many discussions in The Hague, we've had uh, many discussions actually in Washington, D.C., uh, where, I, where I work, um, but not much here in Geneva, so I, I suggest that we try to do a, a panel, a very, um, you know, I think informed panel, of a number of us who deal with this issue all the time. So let me very quickly uh, introduce everybody. There's a short little uh, bio statement on your, on your programs there. Uh, so I won't dwell, dwell on anyone, but to my far left is Alexander Ligatov. And Alexander has uh, been with Green Cross since the beginning, uh, when we were founded 20, 21 years ago now, when Gorbachev founded us. And Alexander was vice president at the time, because Gorbachev was president, actually, at the time. And Gorbachev moved up to chair, and Alexander's been president of Green Cross International now since uh, the year 2000, I think, so, quite a while. Uh, to Alexander's right is uh, Ambassador Sege Batsanov, and I know some of you know Sege. Sege has worked with us at the OPSW. He represented the Russian Federation uh, there, and the uh, director of the Office of Special Project has worked with the OPSW a long time. Uh, he left the LPSW a number of years ago and has been uh, Geneva Director of the uh, Pugwash Councils on Science and, and uh, World Affairs. Uh, very active still in chemical and biological weapons issues and, and uh, nuclear weapons issues with Pugwash. Uh, Ralph Trapp, uh, in the middle here, uh, pick one in the middle, as we say. Uh, Ralph is from uh, uh, East, East Germany originally, uh, German, although he lives in France and uh, has worked at the OPSW in senior levels, uh, been on the Scientific Advisory Board, was it? Board. Yeah. And, uh, and is well known in the, in the field of chemical weapons demilitarization. Jean-Pascal Saunders, also a close colleague and friend of mine, um, used to be here as head of the Biological Weapons Prevention Project, BWPP, we called it, and uh, is now got a really excellent blog I would recommend to you all if you haven't seen it called The Trench as in trench warfare, right? to and, some extent. Entrenched positions. And, and entrenched positions. That those of us who deal with multilateral affairs are all very well aware of <clears throat> these days. Um, and then myself. As you, as you may know, I've worked in the field of non-proliferation and disarmament for a long time, so uh, I don't think uh, I'll say much more than that. Um, I will turn the... What we're going to do here is we, all of us will speak. Uh, we're going to have Alexander give some introductory remarks. Uh, then Sergei Batsanov, we'll have our two Russian colleagues speak first. Uh, we'll say a few words about the background and negotiations on um, and how we got to the point where the Syrians joined the uh, Chemical Weapons Commission. I'll give you a PowerPoint. I'm the only one going to use typical American, right? PowerPoint presentation. Um, I'll do a PowerPoint uh, on sort of background on chemical weapons a bit, where we stand in Russia, the United States, the other declared possession states, and then talk about Syria and some of the conclusions on Syria. <clears throat> and uh, Jean-Pascal Sanders will give us, I think, a very informed view of some of the investigations going on and the like. And then Ralph, um, as the chemist here on the panel, you know, will also provide uh, good commentary on where things are. So I think you're, you're getting, whether you know or not, you're getting, one, I think, one of the most informed discussions uh, on this issue, Syria and chemical weapons disarmament. Uh, that you can possibly get in the diplomatic community from non-governmental organizations. You might be able to get better from some of the inside government folks, but uh, from my perspective, no. But anyway, so with that, let me uh, turn this over to Alexander and let you say some introductory remarks. I would uh, good evening. It's a real pleasure. That I uh, feel uh, very privileged to give the opening remarks to this gathering because uh, uh, it's difficult to find another issue in today's world 
that embodies the complexity, interrelationship of different areas of the world politics and even wider economics. And uh, I would say uh, this issue demonstrates the world in transit today, if I may say so. Uh, it's already the third time that uh, uh, Green Cross, together with Bagwash International, convenes um, meetings on uh, Syria. The previous two were dedicated to uh, Syrian uh, agenda, I mean not related directly to the disarmament and chemical weapons. And uh, this is the first time we try jointly to uh, tackle with these issues. Uh, today and for me it's a special occasion because Green Cross is a very specific organization one of the few organizations that focuses on the critical nexus uh, between uh, uh, three agendas that is security, development and environment and uh, <clears throat> uh, this issue that we are going to discuss tonight clearly falls into this approach and that's why we also think that it's very high on the priority of uh, the Green Cross today. Um, I would say that uh, today there is a tendency, a trend to relate the issues of the climate change to security. And that's a commendable change in the approach of, of nation states to the issues of both security and climate change. But I would even invite to broaden the agenda because we are talking about multifaceted crisis. We are talking about uh, water problems, we are talking about climate, we are, we are talking about food problems and everything is related. Even in Syria agenda, how you could treat what's going on regardless of water uh, situation in the basin of the Middle East. It's all related and it must be taken into account if you want to achieve a, a reasonable success. Unfortunately, we feel on many issues on this exactly agenda, I mean Syria um, chemical weapons, that this traditional red tape approach interferes with the successful uh, development of this project. But anyway, I don't want to take too much time. This round table still is devoted to a very clear and special, special chemical weapons demilitarization program. <coughs> that is of the Syrian Arab Republic. And this program is unprecedented, both in its original design, in political context, in difficulties of implementation in the war-torn country today. And of course a revolutionary solution to the actual destruction of chemical weapons, not on the territory of the owner, of the holder of the chemical weapons, but even not in the, ter on, in the territory on the territory of the other country, but in the international waters. The program suffers from lots of delays, problems, it is not over yet, and we are still not sure that it will be implemented. There are credible doubts to that. But still, the novelty of the approach, the achievements uh, that have been brought in already today give some modest uh, expectations that uh, we can dwell on that, analyze that, and maybe draw some lessons about this kind of um, uh, program and its credibility. Speaking on behalf of Pagos, I would like to sort of return to you the words of satisfaction that you pronounced just a moment ago about cooperating with Pagos. It is also a great pleasure on our side. 
uh, and also extend the words of thank of thanks to uh, the CAF, uh, on whose territory uh, we are now having our meeting, uh, for actually them hosting this meeting this time, uh, although the actual uh, preparatory work uh, we saved them from it this time around, maybe we would not do it next time. Or maybe we would. Uh, one uh, point. Uh, Alexandra, you mentioned, uh, and I fully agree, that this is a unique uh, operation, uh, the Syrian or chemical weapons uh, disarmament uh, demilitarization. Um, I think I would dare to suggest that uh, while it is not yet over, indeed a lot of ground has already been covered, uh, and while uh, nobody can for sure say when the operation will successfully end, there are, I think, chances. I would, I, I think, I would be a bit more positive. A, a bit less pessimistic with you, I don't know how to measure it with uh, glass and water criteria, but uh, I'm, I'm probably more optimistic. But yes, uh, there are still things that can derail this operation. Uh, nevertheless, it's time to start um, making some preliminary maybe, but conclusions, observations, lessons, uh, both uh, for the uh, OPCW regime, maybe for the international institutions, because OPCW had to cooperate very closely with the UN and form a special uh, team, which uh, is both, I think was both a result of and a compromise between different views about who should manage uh, and control this Syrian chemical disarmament process, OPCW with its uh, methodology, its tradition, uh, its uh, school of its culture, or maybe more something more in the UN. Uh, and in the UN we have uh, some, uh, let's say, um, Presidents like Anscombe and Movic. Uh, so there were initially rather opposing ideas on that side, but in the reality itself pushed towards uh, this kind of merger of efforts and even uh, structural merger to an extent between the OPCW and the UN because uh, the kind of work that was needed to be done in Syria uh, went beyond uh, the normal, let's say, regular responsibilities and skills of the OPCW. Now, counting weapons, whatever, weighing, uh, uh, you know, the various stockpiles, it is, of course, something that the OPCW can do best know uh, word about that. But uh, agreeing, let's say, on temporary ceasefires within a country uh, torn away by a civil war, uh, negotiating with, let's say, government forces, pro-government militias, which are not government forces, also something separate, uh, with different uh, military uh, opposition. This is something that the OPCW was not uh, taught to do and does not have a mandate to do. Um, so there comes UN in the first place. Uh, I, without going into too much details, I, uh, too many details, I think I would very uh, quickly run through uh, the facts that preceded. Um, the OPCW involvement uh, with the Syrian chemical disarmament, 
and see the joining uh, the Chemical Weapons Convention and becoming a member of the OPCW. And then uh, I actually would uh, pass the microphone to Paul Walker who would talk in more details about how this program, uh, this armament program, uh, was being implemented. Uh, then uh, Jean Pascal will talk about uh, primarily uh, the issues of alleged use and Ralph Trapp uh, well, would make conclusions on whatever aspect he would consider appropriate. <laughs> uh, well, uh, civil war in Syria, growing concern uh, concerns in several quarters about the use of chemical weapons. What about uh, non-state actors taking control of at least some of those chemical weapons? Or about uh, some other form of proliferation? Syria does not uh, accept so far, uh, I'm not talking about today, I'm talking about the past, does not accept that it is a possessor state, that it has chemical weapons making some occasional statements that could be interpreted in that sense, but then kind of denying them uh, two or three or four days later. Then beginning uh, of a new period when various reports, unclear, contradictory, um, sometimes suspiciously looking, begin to arrive about uh, instances of use of chemical weapons, mostly by the government, but not only, also by uh, the military opposition. Uh, each side denying the uh, accusations uh, addressed against it. Uh, and we have this accumulation of uh, this atmosphere of suspicion, which, uh, which also uh, goes parallel, in parallel, with uh, expression of various kinds of fears, what would happen if uh, these weapons would end up in uh, some other kind of conflict, would be used by players maybe involved in the Syrian uh, civil war, but which also have other agendas, uh, and so on and so forth. So we have uh, a constantly raising temperature of fear and, uh, let's say, bad expectations around Syrian chemical weapons. Um, after a long period of um, push and pull, I call it, of negotiations, discussions, uh, clumsy steps in New York uh, during um, spring and summer of uh, 2013, the UN mechanism, or rather UN Secretary General's mechanism to investigate allegations of use of chemical and biological weapons, finally goes to Syria uh, to visit uh, a small number of places which had been which had been negotiated. And in August uh, 21, a couple of days after the arrival of the team, a huge uh, well, alleged use incident. Uh, for many, uh, it was almost simultaneously clear who uh, were the, the perpetrators, the regime. And there was a seemingly unstoppable wave of political and material preparations uh, for action to punish the uh, Assad government for that incident. Now, I must say, not uh, every country believed in that. There were uh, different stories, different explanations. And until now, I have not yet seen uh, a final conclusion. Not to mention, of course, such, uh, or not to forget such a detail that uh, the, any inspections uh, activities conducted under the banner of the UN Secretary General's mechanism uh, can only establish the fact of use, 
but they cannot address the question of who used chemical weapons. So the team which was there in August, of course, confirmed the use, the fact of use. It is not in its mandate to discuss who used it. Uh, a number of elements in the report though, were immediately used to show uh, by others that it couldn't be anybody but um, the Assad government. I'm not going to continue on that, but just to register a point that there was a fundamental disagreement um, on the question of who is the perpetrator or who was the perpetrator, at least between the US and Russia. And what is nice about the story which followed, that while maintaining this fundamental disagreement, the two sides, initially two sides and then uh, the rest of, of the international community, found an agreement about how to proceed uh, in response to something on which they could not agree. And I'm to, uh, honestly, uh, and what happened was that at that time uh, Russia was expecting the worst to happen uh, in that area and there were also very big concerns about uh, if this bombing campaign against the uh, Syrian government were to take place of course uh, it would not be just dealing somehow with chemical weapons but actually preparing the military ground or change of situation on the ground to ensure the defeat of uh, Assad's government and, this, uh, and rather quick defeat. Uh, also obvious that uh, Russia was not uh, happy to see that happening. Uh, apart from uh, generaliz generalization of uh, the conflict and maybe its expansion into other areas, uh, which was also compounded, or depending on where you look at Rome, maybe reinforced, from another concern of Moscow, uh, and that was already uh, quite visible for it, uh, about possible rapid deterioration uh, of um, U.S.-Russian relations as a result of that. Certain cal calculations have been made at that time, not uh, when Ukraine came. But the intention was to do whatever is possible uh, to prevent that whole thing from happening. So the result was the Russian initiative um, during uh, the St. Petersburg G20 and discussions with uh, Obama and Cameron. Uh, the first initial reaction then on the 9th of uh, September the Syrian foreign minister was in Moscow uh, first agreeing to declare and dismantle chemical weapons under international control. And just a day later, finally agreeing, it, it, it was not done, it was not said at the same time, agreeing to joining the Chemical Weapons Convention, which opens the way to Lavrov uh, Kerry meeting in Geneva, which produced an agreement uh, on the 14th of September, which then uh, went into that agreement uh, into the OPCW uh, for its more detailed. Uh, work on it, and which ended up with the decisions of the OPCW Executive Council resolutions and uh, of the United Nations Security Council, basically reinforcing one another. Uh, so uh, I uh, think I mentioned that one of these peculiarities is that with a good diplomacy you can make people agree in a, in a very conflictual situation uh, on a course of action, even if they disagree on a very important component of uh, how they assess the, the situation. Second, 
is that yes, um, the Syrian government agreeing uh, to join the Chemical Weapons Convention and to have this destruction process uh, definitely helped improve uh, helped improve its image and legitimacy, and it became a member of the OPCW, capable of negotiating. Uh, the process of the implementation with the OPCW and so on and so forth. Uh, in particular, Lavrov Kerry meeting in September uh, allowed to find, um, a, I think, a good and very well working compromise uh, on the roles, respective roles, of the OPCW and the UN. Uh, I believe that. Um, this worked very well. Um, the question now is when the role of the UN would start uh, decreasing. There are different views of that. Uh, but so far it was extremely, uh, extremely uh, helpful. Um, in my personal view, the timelines agreed by Kerry and Lavrov were not, unre were not very realistic from the very beginning. But my take it that the, is that the Russian side was pressing for longer timelines, the US was pressing for even shorter. So that was a compromise sufficient at that time and adequate at that time to resolve, uh, to start moving uh, forward in a constructive way. Um, we uh, often think about the Chemical Weapons Convention in terms of long processes of destruction, long timelines. But uh, what uh, Lavrov and Kerry and Reed was not against the Convention. The Convention does contain uh, procedures that really allowed to the Executive Council to approve such rather draconic uh, timelines. Uh, another thing that the uh, convention mechanism and rules allow is to treat the situations in which timelines are not uh, met, uh, not just depending on this fact only, but taking into account the whole sum of factors affecting uh, the situation. Um, in any way, uh, the flexibility uh, of the OPCW regime and the CWC was tested and the results were rather spectacular. What uh, probably was not uh, realized uh, to the maximum extent possible was a degree during those September days of 2013 was a degree of uh, opposition and disappointment by coming from some of the American allies, uh, especially in the area, but not only, about the absence uh, or resulting absence of uh, American strikes on Damascus and uh, on Syria. Uh, maybe there was a need to pay more attention uh, to diplomacy with them, although sometimes, uh, well, I, I personally have doubts that would be extremely helpful. Why? Because uh, it's them, it's they who uh, have a lot of influence on the uh, military opposition in Syria, on how they behave, what they do, what they don't do, uh, and so on and so forth. And for the purposes of this operation, it could have been better if, uh, let's say, the military opposition uh, was more cooperative in this sense. And for that, you probably needed to talk more with uh, some of the US allies in the area. Um, to um, sum up, again, the story is not finished. Uh, more than 92% of uh, Syrian chemical weapon stockpiles, declared stockpiles, has been loaded uh, on the ships uh, at the port of Latakia 
and a small number destroyed in Syria uh, itself. Uh, there has been progress in the implementation of other disarmament uh, provisions uh, of the Chemical Weapons Convention, like uh, disabling and destroying chemical weapons production and filling equipment uh, in Syria, uh, so that, by the way, whatever remains in Syria, about 7-8%, can not be, in fact, readily used anymore. Uh, but uh, the timelines have been crossed. There are new reports of uh, use of chlorine as weapons in Syria. Again, reports are controversial. Uh, for some, including myself, again suspicious. And uh, I am beginning to uh, have a similar feeling I had in August that maybe the let's say military attack scenario uh, is not back on the scene uh, in the same way it was in, during the last 10 days of August last year, but that there are attempts to revive it. I note therefore that uh, uh, Secretary Kerry was much more careful recently when he mentioned about, or when he was talking about response, he did not specify when and how this response might take place, uh, or rather he was using the word consequences. Uh, and certainly he, at least, did, did not say and ha has not said up to this moment Please correct me if, if I'm missing something that could have happened just uh, an hour or so ago. Uh, he did not say definitely what uh, had happened. So there are some differences in this confusing picture. Um, but I would be tempted to uh, be careful and to see what can be done to prevent the return to the last autumn or last August scenarios. Thank you so much. We've been all working for almost a century trying to get rid of chemical weapons. And this is a very famous picture from World War One. you know, that uh, shows <clears throat> soldiers marching with their hands on the shoulders of the soldiers in front of them who've all been blinded and have bandages around their eyes by the, the German use of chlorine in World War One. And uh, this happened April 22nd, 1915. And so, uh, we'll all be commemorating this tragic, this tragic experience when the Germans brought in uh, 5,700 canisters, ironically, of chlorine gas. Uh, and uh, when the wind was you know, blowing in the right direction against the, the Belgians and the French and the British and a number of others, uh, they released, they opened, opened the canisters. So these, this was not weapons, but canisters probably very similar to what we see having been used in Syria today. Uh, and the, the gas, which is heavier than air, you know, slowly drifted across and sunk into the trenches. And, and the uh, opposing soldiers had, you know, one, two choices. They could stay in the trenches and die, uh, with the chlorine sinking in and filling the trenches, or they could jump out and get machine gunned right away. Or they could try to um, um, uh, use wet cloths uh, to cover their eyes and their nose and their throat and try to somehow survive. So these are the survivors. In World War I, <clears throat> I have a number of other slides on World War I I usually use that I won't use here. Uh, but in World War I, it's estimated somewhere in the range of 90,000 troops died due to use of chemical weapons, and about a million were injured. And of course, after the Germans uh, first used this sort of ad hoc method of just opening compressed gas canisters of chlorine on April 22nd in Belgium, uh, in the Flanders fields in Ypres, uh, of course, everyone else then followed suit. So the British and <clears throat> the French and the US, everyone else began to develop, of course, chemical weapons at that point. So under the Chemical Weapons Convention, what was, what was and I'll skip the whole 20th century history of, of chemical warfare. Uh, you know, what are, the, what are the stockpiles look like? We all know this well, I think, but I think some of you in the audience probably don't. You know, there have been eight declared possessor states uh, formally declared under the Chemical Weapons Convention. 
those eight are here, the two big ones, as you can see, which have well over 95% of the stockpiles, uh, are the United States and Russia. Russia declared 40,000 metric tons, uh, the United States 28,600, which is 31,500 US tons, which is how I first learned about it. Um, and I first got very involved in all this in the demilitarization side, technology choice, uh, citizen involvement, uh, the politics of it all has been very, very uh, contentious in both Russia and the United States and elsewhere. Uh, back when I worked on the Armed Services Committee in the U.S. House of Representatives back in the early to mid-1990s. And I managed the first uh, on-site, official on-site American inspection of a Russian chemical weapon stockpile in July 1994. <clears throat> so I've been... It, it, going to one of these stockpiles back then when there was very little security on the stockpiles, there was very little inventory, if any, on the weapons, uh, really, as we say, kind of brought you to Jesus in this field and convinced you that, in fact, this was a field that had to be addressed and, and quickly. So <clears throat> I've really been deeply involved in the chemical weapons stories here really since the early to mid-1990s. Uh, um, India with somewhere around 1,000 metric tons, I don't think we know, at least I don't know the uh, uh, the right number. India still maintains the uh, confidentiality on, on its declared stockpile. Uh, South Korea, somewhere around a thousand tons. You can do this sort of back, back of the envelope calculations, but nobody quite knows what the number was there. And we're, we're, those of us in the NGO community are still kind of curious as to why both India and South Korea, South Korea in particular, maintain such high degrees of confidentiality on this one. These are real success stories. And the Americans are quite open, the Russians are quite open. Um, so we keep pressing both those delegations and those countries to uh, sort of come clean and tell the story on their destruction program. Um, Libya, 26 metric tons. You know, Libya was the first country which we know uh, intentionally cheated under the Chemical Weapons Convention, uh, where Gaddafi declared a stockpile of about 23 tons, if I recall correctly, and uh, that began destruction eventually. And then, of course, after regime change in, in Libya, uh, another three tons of weaponized uh, mustard agent was found. So uh, that's all been destroyed, at least the, all the, the live agents. <clears throat> um, Albania, 16 metric tons. Albania is a funny story, too, where um, Albania joined the convention as a non possessor state, and then in the early 2000s came to the OPSW of the Hague with sort of a, oops, you know, we think we found something called in the, uh, the Swiss and the, the Germans and the Americans and others and investigated and took samples and sure enough it was a mustard stockpile in the mountains right outside of Tirana. And we're all just so thankful that this little garage up in the mountains of Albania was discovered in time before any of those drums disappeared. And I'll, I'll show you a picture of, of that later on. Um, Albania was also the first country which technically violated one of the CWC deadlines. You know, the original 100% uh, destruction deadline was April 29th, 2007. And Albania thought everything was going fine. The, the Germans built a small incinerator to bring to Albania. Uh, the Americans were providing scientific advice, the Swiss the same. And, uh, and they operated the incinerator as if each of these mustard-filled drums would burn up in about, it was a small incinerator with an afterburner to you know, burn up the, uh, the, the uh, exhaust gases would burn up in about 19 minutes. And the first drum they put in burned up in 19 seconds, <clears throat> literally exploded in the incinerator uh, when the heat became high enough and burned a hole right through the bottom of the furnace. And so suddenly they had to shut off. Luckily, nobody was killed uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the accident. And ironically, Albania had to stretch out its destruction program then by a few months uh, because they couldn't immediately get a, uh, a welder who was licensed to weld furnaces. And that took about six weeks just to bring the welder in. And, uh, and by that time, Albania has actually technically violated the April 29, 2007 deadline at the LPCW. So it was a good, a good case in point where everyone kind of slapped Albania on the wrist, you know, a little bit and said they violated the deadline. But of course, it wasn't their fault, and, and nobody blamed them. Uh, but it, it sort of, I think, loosened, loosened up the game a little bit, particularly when later on uh, the Americans and the Russians and the Libyans missed their deadlines as well in 2012. Uh, Iraq, I have NA, you know, not available there, uh, because the Iraqis, as, as probably many of you know, have two large uh, sealed bunkers <clears throat> left over from the first Gulf War, 
uh, sealed up by the, uh, by the United Nations inspectors in the mid-1990s, and everything chemical-related was thrown into these bunkers, including weapons. And unfortunately, uh, one of the bunkers has a 2,000-pound American dropped, unexploded bomb in the middle of it. And so the challenge now that, that we talk about in, uh, in the OPSW a lot <clears throat> is how do we access these bunkers safely? How do we evaluate really what's in there? Um, and how do we destroy it? And there's still debate over the destruction process of those two bunkers. And then of course Syria with 1,300 tons. So the, the grand total was somewhere around 72,000 tons. And that, that uh, I always say don't take this for an exact number because those numbers there don't even add to 72,500. But the numbers vary over time. And I think you'll see the Syrian numbers will vary slightly over time too as they more accurately weigh each, each barrel, each ton container, each weapon system. Uh, and the declarations become slightly modified over time. But it's in this range, and it also depends also the numbers where you start counting from. Remember, the United States began destroying its stockpile in 1990, when the first incinerator began operating on Johnson Atoll in the Pacific Ocean. That was seven years before the treaty ended in force. So looking at the U.S. numbers, you always have to be careful whether you're looking at the 1997 number, which was what f was formally you know, counted as the treaty entered in force, or the 1990 number, which was also declared by the United States. Uh, and between 1990 and 97, I think the U.S. destroyed about 1,400 tons. So U.S. destruction, uh, just quickly mention, you know, we've been destroying chemical weapons in the United States now for 23 years. Um, construction has been even longer than that. 90% uh, has been destroyed. Um, the, last, the last weapon destroyed was in January of 2012. Uh, so we haven't had any destruction going on in the United States for about a year and a half. Now as we build the final, the Americans build the final two sites. Um, I just point out, you know, seven stockpiles of nine have been uh, fully destroyed and closed and remediated. There's still remediation going on. Uh, and two facilities are under construction. Pueblo, Colorado, which is pretty much fully built and undergoing systemization right now is a big mustard agent stockpile and then uh, uh, Bluegrass Kentucky uh, which is a uh, much smaller 475 ton nerve agent, largely nerve agent stockpile but it's all weaponized and uh, will be probably the smallest but the most difficult in the end because it's so heterogeneous with every agent, every weapon system almost all with explosives and rocket propellant and the like. Big load of M55s, which are the most delicate and difficult weapon. The picture there is actually of Umatilla, Oregon, the incinerator in Umatilla, Oregon. And these are enormous. Uh, I, I put a few pictures up in these of the incineration um, sites because these are enormous industrial sites that you know, range in cost depending on when you count from three to five billion dollars each, billion with a B. Uh, Russian destruction, also very good progress, but only since, 19, uh, since uh, 2002. So the Russians, you know, I went to Russia and started looking at their stockpiles in 1994. <clears throat> uh, it took them eight years after that point to, in fact, begin physically destroying agent, live agent. And uh, they only started in 2002 because Germany was willing to build, build the, first, uh, the first neutralization site uh, at a place called Gorny in the Saratopolis. So the Russians, to their credit, have only been working at this for, you know, it, it, with live agent destruction uh, since uh, 2002, about 12 years. Uh, but they've actually destroyed more than the, Amer the Americans have over that period. So um, if you look at the per year uh, destruction, you'll find that the, the Russians have destroyed, you know, I know 50% more or so per year, maybe even double. Uh, than the Americans. But you also have to realize the American weapons are actually very complicated, very dangerous, most with agent, uh, rocket propellant, and explosives in them. Whereas the Russian weapons are actually much simpler. You know, punch and drain them, rinse them out, neutralize them. It's not actually, you don't have the danger of explosion. So obviously the, the facilities here are, are much quicker to build, are cheaper to build, uh, easy to, uh, less dangerous to operate. This is actually an aerial bomb that's being opened up from the top. This is from uh, a site called Mar Maradikovsky, and it has uh, its nerve agent inside, and they introduce neutralant into the bomb. They f figure out how much airspace is in the bomb, introduce neutralant into the bomb. You can see they're all masked up and covered. Uh, and then they close it up again, and it's sort of an exothermic chemical reaction 
let the roller bomb back into the warehouse, let it sit for you know a couple of months, and it actually self-destructs, neutralizes in the bomb. They bring it back, test it a bit. If it's sufficiently neutralized, at least three nines, ideally six nines, 99.9999%, uh, then you can actually move it on, drain it, move it on for secondary secondary treatment. Uh, the Russians, as I say, have over 76%, probably it's closer to maybe 80% today. Um, and um, their official date to finish is December 31st, 2015, so 18 months from now. I, think, I bet all of us on the panel here agree there's no way they're going to make, make that deadline. So the question now, I think, is when will Russia announce their new schedule? <clears throat> and I say here it's anywhere from three to six years to go. Uh, depends on your assumptions, but it's going to be several, several more years. So, and other, very quickly, other CD uh, CWD, chem weapons destruction progress, now I'll move to Syria. Albania, we know, as I mentioned, destroyed 2007. Very small stockpile, 16 tons. And that's a picture of it here. These are actually the barrels of mustard agent um, that all had Chinese markings on the outside. Going. South Korea, 2008, uh, but we don't know anything about, the, I don't anyway, about the South Korean program. Uh, India, 2009, we don't know too much about the Indian program, but we know more, <coughs> uh, at least, than we do about the South Korean program. And South Korea, by the way, is a country that doesn't allow its name to be used in diplomatic circles as a possessor state. So if, you, if you're in The Hague, as some of you know, we always talk about the United States, Russia, Albania, Libya, da 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 and another state party. <clears throat> um, and everyone sort of chuckles in the audience, like, oh yeah, South Korea. Um, so I keep recommending to the South Koreans, please, you know, you know, get beyond this confidentiality and just tell us the full story. Um, Libya, 2013, finished the, at least the initial uh, Schedule 1 destruction of, uh, of their arsenal. Iraq declared in 2009, but we really still don't know what's going to happen to these bunkers and how long it's going to take and who's going to pay for it. It's going to be very expensive, very dangerous. Uh, and then Syria, of course, ideally destroyed in 2014. But, so let's come to that. Uh, very quickly, because Sega has gone over this, uh, July 23rd, 2012, almost, you know, almost two years ago now, the Syrians admitted, a lower level foreign ministry official, if I'm correct, admitted that Syria had chemical weapons. Because that was, as Sergei referred to, that was then denied, denied, denied by the Syrian higher level officials in the foreign ministry. December 23, 2012, first alleged attack with chemical weapons. And then you came down to March, March, April 29th, uh, April 29th, uh, alleged attacks. And then, of course, the August 21st attack, which launched everything and got the ball rolling, not only with the threat of uh, attack from the United States, <clears throat> but also, of course, then. Uh, the agreement of, of Syria to accede to the uh, Chemical Weapons Convention. Uh, September 14th is the formal date that the OPCW recognizes uh, Syria having joined the treaty. Uh, a month later, of course, it actually act actually enters into force uh, for the, whatever country is, is acceding. And this is actually the, the General Assembly, uh, the con annual conference of states parties at the uh, OPCW, by the way. Okay, what do we do with it all? Syria's declared about 1,335 metric tons. I don't know if we're all agreed on that number. The numbers shift, I find, a little bit here and there. The most common number you hear talked about is 1,300 metric tons. If you go back and try to you know, do your back of envelope calculations from the uh, OPCW uh, releases, it's around 1,335. I frankly think nobody really knows yet what the exact number is. Uh, but I think it's probably you know five less than five percent one way or the other. Um, Twenty-three tons of that is mustard agent, and to everyone's surprise, that's the only live agent that's been declared by Syria. So the other thirteen hundred odd tons are precursor chemicals. So you oftentimes hear people talk about the chemical weapons. Well, in fact, there's only twenty-three metric tons of chemical agent itself here. The other 1,300 tons are all kind of dual-use industrial chemicals. 92.5% uh, removed to date. I'm not going to go through all the chemicals, and we don't even know that fully, uh, because Syria has you know, asked that, in fact, most of this be kept confidential. 92.5% removed to date that Syria referred to uh, in about, I think it's 18 shipments, you know, overland. It's taken a while to get those moved, given the Civil War, rebel forces, given the Syrian demand for armor blankets over the shipping containers and, and a variety of other needs, some of which the Russians 
<clears throat> provided because it's really military equipment and could be used far beyond the shipment of these chemicals. Remaining 7.5% removed in May, question mark. Um, these were all supposed to be removed by February 5th. That was a very tight timeline, that you, the ambitious timeline you talked about, Sergei. Nobody realized that, nobody really felt that that was going to be reachable, I think. And as time progressed in December and January, we knew we were going to miss the February 5th deadline. Two other dates were talked about, April 13th and April 27th. The Syrian, I think the Russians first said April 13th, they'll all be out of Syria. Um, the Syrians themselves had said, no, April 27th is more realistic. Of course, this is now May 19th. So we're approaching almost a month after the last deadline we talked about. Uh, so the deadlines have slipped and slipped and slipped. But frankly, you know, when you look back in the last 23 years of chemical weapons destruction, there's barely been a single deadline in any country that's been met. So, so deadlines, we know it's a very difficult process. It's complicated. You really don't know what the weapons hold until you start to access them. Uh, we're going to find out more, I think, when we get everything on the Cape Ray. Complete destruction in 2014. So the, the, the schedule right now is ideally that everything, all of the priority one, the most uh, dangerous chemicals, uh, it's over 500 tons, will be neutralized on board the Cape Ray by the end of June. I think all of us on this panel, I believe, will be agreed that that's not going to happen now because of this two-month delay in shipment out of Syria. Uh, the Cape Ray experts, the neutralization experts, have all said it will take at least 60 days to neutralize with everything going perfectly, which it never does. And it may take 90 days or more if there are some stops and starts, rough seas, anything else on the ship. So, you know, if you don't get all the chemicals out in May, or even if you do get them out by the end of this month <clears throat> from Syria, the other 100 tons that are sitting in a single site outside of Damascus, uh, then you have June. You have one month to complete a process which the operators of the system on the Cape Ray have said would take at least two months, minimum, in the best of cases. So. I think we're looking at the Cape Ray operations finishing neutralization probably in uh, August, September, sometime at the best, in the earliest time frame. And then the question, of course, is can you get complete destruction, which means second stage destruction as well? Because all of the chemicals that are neutralized on the Cape Ray have to go through a second stage process on land somewhere. And the other non-priority non one or priority two chemicals have to go and be processed elsewhere as well. And those processes, if you talk to the Germans, uh, the Finns, and the Brits, and the Americans, uh, those actually will take probably six to nine months, maybe 12 months to do. So everything will actually begin, I think, to uh, roll over well into 2015. Public concerns and protests. Um, you know, the sad, the sad thing, I think, that was alluded to earlier is that um, the OPCW of the United Nations uh, tried, I think, to some extent, to convince our European allies that, in fact, uh, these should be processed on land. Once the decision was made, it was too dangerous to do in Syria. Um, the decision was made, let's take it somewhere nearby, ideally some country around the Mediterranean. Um, you know, early on, you may have heard Norwegians said no. Uh, a couple of other West European countries said no. Uh, and then Albania was, was posed as maybe the country that would do it, and everyone said, why Albania? You know? I can talk about that more if you want, but I don't think, in fact, sufficient time was given to talk with countries about this. This is a complicated process, obviously, particularly if you're a country that's never done chemical weapons destruction. These are weapons mass destruction. It's a dangerous process. Um, some people like to underplay it. I usually say, let's just be realistic. These are dangerous chemicals. You know, when you're bringing in hundreds, maybe thousands of tons of this stuff, you have to do environmental impact reviews, you have to do regulatory issues, you have to manage public outreach and facilitation, all the like. So, winding up, you know, as a last ditch effort to put it on a ship, now the MV Cape Ray that I'll show a picture of here, and process all this dangerous, you know, toxic industrial chemicals on the high seas in the Mediterranean has raised all sorts of concerns. To some extent, paranoia, I think, on the part of people, but We've argued that there has to be an integrated strategic approach to public outreach and discussion. And we, we as Green Cross and Pugwash as well, and our Chemical Weapons Convention Coalition have always been 
uh, extremely uh, underlining, emphasizing the importance of, of on every project of this nature that goes out. Because we've done this in the United States for over 20 years, and in Russia now for you know, over 15 years or 20 years, back to the 90s. We've done public outreach, facilitation, consensus building, stakeholder involvement. You know, people have to understand this better. Not everyone's a chemist. Not everyone has done hydrolysis of weapons of mass destruction before, uh, or nor incineration. And so you have to be very, very careful right up front. And I think, number one, that's been one of the challenges in this whole program, is there's been insufficient public information and outreach. I know the OPSW and the United Nations Joint Task Force of all, Joint Mission have all tried their best. <clears throat> the U.S. government has tried its best. The U.S. Department of Defense, in its own way, tried its best. But frankly, from my mind, there's been grossly insufficient public information available. Uh, we've all been able to get it as experts kind of in the field, and we're digging all the time, spending a lot of time in this, but if you, uh, you know, were flying on the wall listening to the reporters' questions I get almost every day uh, from all over the world, you'll realize that people don't understand this, and they're very worried about it, and very suspicious, and if they can't get information from government officials and official sources, they become, you know, un unconfident, I guess, non-confident in, in fact, the process. So. These are actually pictures of uh, protests of about 10,000 people that turned out in Crete. We've had similar protests in Athens, uh, in Istanbul, uh, in Italy, and Spain. And we've had uh, long uh, protest letters signed by 10,000 people or more from these countries. Uh, we've had formal demolishes from the Turkish and the Greek uh, foreign ministries complaining about uh, the dangers and the risks involved in processing these in the Mediterranean. So, this is still a growing challenge, I think, and we're coming up against, you know, when the Cape Ray is going to sail with these chemicals, hopefully in the next month, uh, if all goes according to plan now. And I don't, we, we don't know, frankly, as NGOs, how we can manage this better. But we, we have pursued it. We've done formal letters to all the appropriate powers of be, including our own Secretary of Defense and our own Secretary of State. And a letter signed by probably 25 of us in the field, I think, three months ago, has yet to even get a response from uh, the U.S. government. So the destruction process itself, this is, a, this is kind of a whiz-bang. Uh, it looks kind of whiz-bang on the, on, the, on the stage like this. And you can see the size of it because of the size of the, the operators here. It's quite large, but frankly, it's, it's a big plumbing operation. It's a wet chemistry operation. Uh, Pour the chemicals in, also pour in hot water, in some cases sodium hydroxide. There are certain recipes for certain chemicals you have to use. It all gets mixed in that big mixing tank with a big, you know, it's like a big mix master inside. And then it's pumped out once you've, you feel it's sufficiently hydrolyzed or neutralized uh, into storage tanks. Um, the priority chemicals, about 560 metric tons, will be hydrolyzed on the MV Cape Ray. There are two of these units on the Cape Ray. Uh, there's a there's a cannibalized third unit that's been brought in from Aberdeen, Maryland, where these were built uh, in the United States to be used for spare parts. And I think all of us actually have a lot of confidence in this process. We've neutralized, in the United States, we've neutralized two sites completely already. Uh, Aberdeen, Maryland, which had, what, 1,200 tons of mustard agent, and uh, Newport, Indiana, which had a couple thousand tons of uh, nerve agent. Uh, in fact, these, this is the same tank. These are the same tanks that were actually used at Aberdeen, Maryland previously. So I think we're confident in the process, but we've also seen in the past, both in Newport, Indiana, and Aberdeen, Maryland, there have been stops and stops. And some of these chemicals tend to uh, clog up, like you have a clog in your you know, toilet or plumbing or your kitchen sink. They sometimes tend to clump and crystallize, and so you gotta get in there just like a plumber, you know, it puts in a big snake. You gotta get in there, or either change the pipe or change a valve or whatever. So there, there are problems that arise you have to be very watchful of. Uh, the operators of this, I think, are very capable and confident that this will go smoothly. But I think there'll be, you know, there'll be shutdowns from time to time to clear the pipes and figure out why it didn't hydrolyze quite as well as you thought it was and gotta put it back through the system again. The good news is that uh, the neutralization processes have been heavily supported by public health and environmental experts, myself included, in the United States over incineration because these are, you know, it's sort of batch, treat, test, control, either release at that point to a secondary treatment or put it right back through again. So 
So you don't have to, you don't lose control of the chemicals and the liquids when you throw it in. It's fully controllable. You measure what's in there, how much destruction you've achieved. And on board the ship, I know they're aiming for three nines, 99.9% .9 destroyed, which is quite good. It's not good as six nines, but it's three nines. <coughs> 154 metric tons ought to be burned in the United, in the United Kingdom, an incinerator at Ellesmere, and those will go directly on board, I assume, the Norwegian ship, but I'm not sure, of the shipment process yet. That's, there's been no information on the shipping uh, routes and all. 122 tons about treated in Syria itself, that's the isopropanol, which neutralizes very well with water. I just mix it with water. And most of that's actually already been done in Syria, I think about 95% of it. Uh, 500 metric tons treated in the United States and Finland. Uh, it's going to a place called uh, Ecochem in Finland. Uh, and it's going to an uh, incinerator in Port Arthur, Texas, which is right outside of Houston, Texas, uh, called Veolia Environmental Services. The challenge there in, in Texas that we know well is Texas has burned a lot of um, the, the big industrial solid waste and liquid incinerators there. And they burned a lot of the uh, toxic waste from, uh, from the U.S. program, from the incinerator program, and from the neutralization program. Uh, the challenge is that it's a very controversial process. Uh, environmental and public health authorities don't like it very much. Uh, they don't like incineration in general, no matter what it is. But if you're burning weapons of mass destruction, you can imagine the, you know, the concern. And it also sits right in the middle of a very poor black uh, community, an African American community. So the Port Arthur, Port Arthur, Texas facility, which to my knowledge has never had any major accidents, is operating very well, has a very hard time, may have a very hard time unless there's public outreach done in Port Arthur, uh, as was the case before. Now, I could show you, I, I don't know here, but I could show you pictures of big protests in Port Arthur, Texas uh, earlier times. And then 6,000 metric tons, give or take a couple hundred tons, of effluent of the neutralized chemicals from the Cape Ray will also go to these sites. And that's the Cape Ray on the left uh, in Rota, Spain. And those are some of the tanks on board which will be used for storage. All of this will be self-contained. It's all um, you know, under-pressurized. Uh, it's all with uh, skirts so liquid doesn't leak out. There have been loads of allegations and the protests that a lot of this is going to be dumped overseas. And once it's neutralized, you dump it overboard and it won't happen. As the U.S. State Department likes to say, there will not be one gram of, of this liquid. I'm not convinced of that quite, but there won't be any large amounts that will be dumped in the Mediterranean at all. Uh, and the other point I want to make is one of the biggest challenges around this whole process has been uh, money. And a uh, few people kind of recognize this, but this is the list of donors. And I'm not sure this is absolutely complete, so don't hold me if, if some country, if one of you are representing a country that's not up here, that you've given something. Please don't. Hold me to it, but I've taken this from the OPCW official publications and added a few countries into that have given in kind services. And so you have here 27 donors, which is great, I think. Two have pledged as well in the last few weeks India and Italy. Uh, and then I put the number down the bottom there 250 million euros. Uh, the OPCW itself, the trust fund, the so called trust fund, is around 50, 47 to 50 million euros, I think, at this point. That covers a lot of the expenses of the OPCW, which, which had, of course, no budget for any of this uh, at all. We can talk about that more if you want. But I've added 200 million in because I think, and it may even be more, that may be an underestimate, uh, because clearly the Cape Ray operation, which is funded by the United States completely, uh, is costing, I bet, at least 150 million, maybe more. Um, and then you've got the two uh, merchant marine ships, the Danish ship from Denmark and the Norwegian ship, which planned on being in the Mediterranean and operating there for about a month to collect all the chemicals from Syria based on the original schedule. These ships cost about 100,000 euros per day to operate. And they've been there now for, what, three months, three and a half months? So you can imagine the, plan, the budget planning in Denmark, in Copenhagen and Oslo at this point, which is probably, you know, three, four, five times the original budgets that were planned. So where they were talking about a few million dollars, now we're talking tens of millions of dollars for those countries. So this is just a rough estimate, but early on, I, I remember delegations saying to me in the LPSW, whole thing won't cost more than 25 or 50 million dollars. I said, you wait and see. 
You know, I said, in the United States, we said $2 million originally, way back 20 years ago. We're now approaching $40 million, or $40 billion, excuse me. $2 billion versus $40 billion. I said, here, 250 I think, is probably an underestimate, if anything. And let me draw conclusions on it quick and turn it over. Number one, chemical agents are no longer viable military weapons and have become taboo, morally reprehensible, and a dangerous burden. I think Syria proves this all over again. As soon as we saw the August 21st attack, it was like, all right, that's it. You know, we had Obama's red line, so to speak. Uh, number two, all possession states must complete safe elimination. We're not there yet. You know, we're, we're a long way there. We're over 80%, I think now, close to 80% globally destroyed. We still have, we're, as we say in football, we're in the final you know, 20 yards. We're in the red, red zone at this point. You've got to push the ball across the goal at this point. And that's going to take still a lot, of more money, a lot more money, a lot more effort. Uh, everyone's, I don't want anyone to take their eye off the prize, basically, of complete 100% abolition of chemical weapons on Earth today. Three, Syria must complete its CW destruction in the near future. I know it's been difficult, the security is tough, the civil war is violent. Uh, but we need very soon, you know, all those chemicals that have been declared removed from Syria so we can begin, begin operations. The Cape Ray itself, the ship, you know, there was this rush to get it ready in December so it could stop processing in January. It's been sitting in Rota, Spain for, what, two and a half months or three months now. So, um, you know, it's just everyone's, it's the old, I'm an old army veteran, so I remember the adage that said, hurry up and wait, all the time, hurry up and wait. So we've been hurrying up and we're waiting now, and waiting and waiting. Uh, four, OPCW investigation of alleged chlorine attacks in Syria is essential to enforce the CWC. Chlorine is not a ban under the CWC. Uh, it's uh, not a declarable chemical. It's an industrial dual-use chemical. We all know used for sewage and swimming pools and everything else. But in fact, it's banned, like all chemicals, from any, any use in warfare under the CWC and the general, the general criteria of the convention. So, if Syria is shown to have been using chlorine in these alleged improvised chlorine bombs, barrel bombs, it's in violation, it's a very serious violation, obviously, of the Chemical Weapons Commission. Five, OPCW investigation of any other concerns, which I think some of my colleagues will talk about more, uh, of states' parties is likewise essential. Uh, there will be questions raised about whether Syria has declared everything, uh, not only weapons, but all of their facilities and stockpiles. And those, once all of the last hundred tons are out of Syria, I think those questions will be formally raised. The next executive, formal executive council meeting is in mid-July. <coughs> Six, protection of the environment, public health, worker safety, and weapons demilitarization in general is an absolute necessity and a higher priority than deadlines and budget limits. And we get into these food fights with our government colleagues and others engineers and the like all the time. But we have a deadline to meet under the Chemical Weapons Convention or under the, some other convention. We've got to meet that at all costs. And we've always said, at least under the Chemical Weapons Convention, we're not doing this to kill people, you know, or workers. We're doing this to, in fact, save lives, save people, build a safer world. And there's no excuse if you need more time uh, or it's going to take more money. <clears throat> there's no excuse to take the time. And that's why I've said for the Cape Ray, this whole operation, it's fine with me if it takes another year, or even maybe even more, uh, as long as it's done safely and, and permanently and irreversibly in, uh, in, 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 uh, along the lines of the convention. Uh, seven, transparency, stakeholder involvement, public dialogue, and consensus building are essential to program success. I can't emphasize this enough. And some of us feel like we're beating our heads against a brick wall half the time with certain states, parties, and delegations that the government, uh, a lot of governments um, uh, of all you know, types and styles, democratic and non-democratic alike, tend to not see this. And, and we've gone through over 20, 20 years of this in the Chemical Weapons Convention, and it's, we've, we've built citizen advisory commissions, we've built local public outreach offices, we've built all sorts of emergency preparedness plans, uh, citizen engagement, national dialogues, on and on and on, which have been enormously essential to both the Russian and American programs. And yet in Syria, this has somehow become an afterthought. You know, well, we don't have the time, you know, for a whole number of reasons. I'm not blaming anybody, but I'm saying 
I think we're heightening the risks that this program could be sidetracked if, in fact, there were major public protests, uh, maybe demonstrations. Who knows? On the high seas, something could happen too, uh, which you probably we probably could have precluded if we had asked everyone in to talk about it. Non-member states must join the CWC. We can abolish all the declared stockpiles, but we still have six countries remaining outside the treaty regime. And a couple of those are very worrisome, as you can see here. Uh, Angola, Egypt, Israel, Myanmar, North Korea, and South Sudan. Uh, Angola and Myanmar are both talking with the OPSW, probably will sign, I think, and join, hopefully in the next year, maybe sooner. Uh, I think, from my perspective, the pressure has to now be put on Egypt and Israel. There's no excuse for any chemical weapons in the Middle East. No excuse for any weapons of mass destruction, period, in the Middle East, or anywhere, from my perspective. But I think the pressure is clearly now on, I think, both those countries, given that the Syrian threat is ending, uh, at least for chemical weapons use. Um, South Sudan, you know, will take time for obvious reasons. And North Korea has absolutely no uh, discussion whatsoever at this point. And we know North Korea has a large chemical weapons stockpile. It's one of the reasons I've been saying to South Korea, play up your unilateral destruction of your stockpile. You know, but who knows, maybe for domestic purposes that's difficult for them. Uh, but I think we have to put pressure on North Korea, perhaps as part of the six-party talks. And then my last point, abolition of all class of weapons of mass destruction is a historic, very historic achievement. And I think we all deserve much credit and need to be very proud of this once, it, once and for all it happens over the next decade. So thank you. I'm going to address the issues of uh, allegations and uh, with the agreement of the conveners, I've split up my presentation in uh, two parts, uh, one on uh, the allegation of use of uh, chemical weapons in the Syrian civil war, the other one uh, allegations concerning the veracity of uh, Syria's uh, declaration. I'll perhaps uh, start with uh, the latter part because it uh, nicely follows up on uh, what uh, Paul has been uh, saying. Um, in, in essence, with a serious uh, declaration to uh, the OPCW, there are uh, three things uh, that are uh, significant uh, issues. Uh, the question is, are there undeclared agents or uh, chemicals? And there is uh, the question of uh, the missed uh, deadlines and whether there are uh, plausible explanations uh, for failing those uh, deadlines. And then the uh, final part here is uh, the destruction of certain uh, installations, issues uh, that are still pending. Uh, coming to the first part about uh, undeclared, uh, well, uh, one thing uh, Paul has already indicated, he mentioned uh, 23 uh, tons, uh, metric tons of declared mustard. Uh, the actual figure is 20.25. Uh, metric tons, but compared to the total volume, it's a very small number. Actually, what has uh, happened is that in March of last year, uh, you know, uh, just before uh, the Kamal Assa, uh attacks uh, that led to the whole process of uh, Syria joining, uh, Syria actually destroyed over 200 metric tons of mustard in uh, three different uh, sites uh, inside uh, Syria, but has not declared this uh, as such uh, to uh, the OPCW. However, they did mention it in the talks leading up to Syria uh, joining uh, the convention, hence uh, knowledge of discrepancy, and uh, inspectors of the OPCW uh, are in the process of uh, determining now uh, the veracity of these uh, numbers. Uh, Syria has uh, provided quite a bit of information and now they are setting up a number of methodologies to go to those sites and actually verify to, to sample uh, the soil, to go through records uh, and, and so forth. In the area of uh, the munitions, uh, probably the one thing uh, that really stands out is, to the best of my knowledge, the types of rockets, uh, the, the Vulcans, uh, vul volcanoes or Vulcans, um, none, of, none of these rockets have been declared as chemical weapons uh, to the OPCW. Uh, Syria handed over two pieces of uh, Vulcan rockets, so you know, two uh, such rockets, but uh, added uh, to it, they're not ours, we've just found them. So the question here is, uh, what happens about it? It's uh, an important thing because uh, if we look at the UN 
uh, investigation, those uh, rockets are implicated in the attacks of uh, Al Ghouta, uh, for example. So th this is one of the uh, elements where uh, some hesitation exists uh, about what actually happened uh, in the Ghouta district and, of course, uh, who might be uh, responsible uh, here. Uh, in, in terms of uh, the missed deadlines, uh, Paul has also mentioned 100 metric tons uh, still have to be uh, moved out of uh, Syria. And uh, what we have there, uh, everything is located at a, a single base uh, which is called Al Sin. Uh, the base is uh, just outside of uh, Damascus, uh, really. But the big problem uh, there is that uh, while government forces have control uh, over that base, they do not control the surrounding uh, environment. And particularly, the two main exit routes are uh, under uh, rebel uh, control. And this has uh, implications. There are secondary roads uh, leading to that base. But uh, just to give you uh, an idea as to why it uh, cannot be moved uh, under the priority one uh, chemical set, as they are called, uh, the direct precursors uh, to uh, the nerve agents, uh, DF, which is one of uh, the key uh, precursors, is stored in 2,000 litre containers. Now, these are huge in volume, so to take them along mountain roads out of the base is pretty hazardous, and while those containers are reinforced, uh, you know, uh, it's quite easy to put uh, an anti-tank anti -tank rocket or whatever into such a convoy with uh, disastrous uh, consequences. Uh, the, the other part, uh, you know, uh, among the P2, the HF, which is also one of uh, the precursor chemicals, uh, they are uh, stored in uh, industry standard uh, containers, which means that they are relatively thin-skinned. Uh, containers and uh, could easily be penetrated by bullets and so on and it's because of these uh, security concerns that uh, at present uh, no movement uh, is uh, possible. And here we really have to see, uh, Paul has already uh, made reference to uh, final deadlines, uh, the coordinator of the uh, OPCW UN mission, Ms. Sigrid uh, Kaag, uh, has uh, hinted now that the 22nd of May, that's in three days, everything would be uh, out of uh, the country, yet uh, I think uh, questions uh, can be raised. I haven't heard anything uh, about movement or that uh, roads have been uh, dégagé, uh, cleared uh, for uh, purposes. Um, the, on, the, on the other hand, one is getting reports that uh, the Syrian government is consolidating the environment uh, around uh, Damascus. So, uh, actually, one of the things uh, to bear in mind always is that getting this whole operation underway has led to quite a bit of intensified fight, uh, fighting in certain areas in order to get those uh, chemicals out of uh, the various uh, locations. The third aspect uh, to mention uh, here is uh, the destruction uh, issue, and it's uh, particularly uh, sites, uh, tunnels, uh, hangars, uh, and so on that uh, need to be destroyed, and where uh, no, uh, how shall I say, consensus seems to be achievable in the near future uh, in the Executive Council of uh, the OPCW. Uh, with uh, the tunnels, um, the, the whole point is that uh, in those uh, tunnels there were the production facilities, they are part of uh, the production facilities for Syria, which under the terms of uh, the Chemical Weapons Convention must be uh, destroyed uh, completely. However, uh, two segments of the tunnels, you, you have to envisage like a staple, you know, an yeah, inverted U type, and one part is the production unit, the two other uh, sectors are storage sites, which under the CWC you do not have to destroy. However, uh, the position uh, has been uh, advanced that those storage sites are directly related to the production and therefore must be destroyed, and actually uh, this is uh, one aspect uh, uh, over which the United States had discussions uh, after its uh, declaration and following negotiations uh, with uh, the technical secretariat, uh, it agreed that some storage 
uh, facilities related to its own production uh, facilities uh, would be destroyed too. So this is part of uh, a controversy uh, that is uh, happening here. Now in uh, the near future, if you're going to read the press, uh, you're going to see that there's going to be a whole new uh, flare-up uh, about uh, Syria, uh, you know, but uh, in the very near future, uh, we must expect a new amendment uh, to its uh, declaration. This is going to include uh, this mustard gas uh, that I have referred to, but also uh, some facilities, uh, including a major research facility it uh, had not uh, declared. Uh, we have already heard of uh, variations uh, in the numbers. Uh, this is true, but it's a greater precision within the different uh, categories. So just to give you one example, uh, even on my blog uh, and initial OPCW documents indicate clearly four types of um, uh, priority one uh, chemicals, one of which we, uh, was called BB salt. Now BB salt uh, is actually not declared by Syria, it's B salt. It, it's a completely different uh, type of uh, agent. Well, wow. um, in any case, what has happened is uh, that there are uh, corrections between, uh, among the numbers between uh, categories, but the aggregate uh, number uh, remains uh, more or less uh, the same, and uh, in the amendments uh, one does not see and one does not expect uh, new chemicals uh, to be uh, declared. So this is a quick update, uh, as far as I know, uh, in terms of um, why there are uh, a number of uh, delays uh, going uh, on. And uh, I agree with Paul, uh, operations will continue into, uh, far into uh, 2015. Uh, I think we have to be uh, prepared uh, for that and uh, focus on the fact that Syria right now does no longer have a warfare capacity with uh, chemical weapons. Now, having said that, we have to come to the various uh, allegations uh, of use. And uh, there are different elements uh, in it. Uh, of course, uh, we have the, the situation, the escalation of, of use. Uh, first, an initial uh, allegation in December of uh, 2012, but definitely an escalation from uh, March uh, onwards, uh, both uh, in terms of the number of alleged incidents and the reported um, uh, intensity of, of those, uh, resulting culminating in uh, Gota in August uh, of last year. Um, of many of those uh, earlier allegations, uh, I uh, remain skeptical and uh, my skepticism, I have to emphasize, it's not that I'm uh, a denier of uh, certain events. It is uh, simply that uh, my own uh, research uh, methodology is uh, trying to understand what actually happened and to make sense of uh, the various phenomena uh, that are being uh, reported. And while we have large numbers of video clips uh, and so on, uh, you know, uh, I'm not in any position to confirm or deny what the video says because for the very simple reason, I don't even know where it was taken and don't know when it was taken. Very often uh, the clips are cut into pieces, they're fast moving uh, things, but there, uh, as far as I know, uh, I haven't seen a single clip where you actually see a victim taken away from the place where the alleged incident uh, took place, accompanied all the way to the hospital, taken into the hospital and seeing what, uh, what is happening uh, to that person. Every, every time it's a separate thing. So it makes it extremely difficult uh, to make uh, any sense. And on top of that, uh, one has to be extremely careful because if uh, an independent expert uh, such as myself makes a statement, uh, people will use that statement for whatever type of uh, political purposes, so I uh, have to be very careful. In that sense, uh, I have to uh, say, uh, in one of my writings I have said, you know, initially, the, the initial 
allegations in March of last year were all about chlorine. The numbers of fatalities and uh, injured people didn't make sense if chlorine was used because one would expect such huge volumes of the agent uh, to be available. Uh, the scenes uh, one saw didn't really uh, match uh, those types of uh, descriptions. But over uh, a number of weeks, all the chlorine became sarine, and in one case it became uh, even eau de javel. Uh, everybody uh, knows that. Uh, me. Uh, we all know uh, about um, the magicians of uh, the Middle Ages who turned uh, lead into gold and uh, so on, but uh, the alchemism uh, in Syria uh, goes in even more uh, mysterious uh, ways. Um, okay, uh, good, uh, everybody knows about that the UN has uh, confirmed uh, Sarin but did not uh, pronounce itself on uh, who might be uh, responsible. But let me, uh, as a uh, concluding uh, section, come to the chlorine, uh, which are uh, some of uh, the more recent uh, allegations uh, that have been uh, going on. And uh, as you're probably aware, uh, last week there was even a, an escalation in terms of the rhetoric uh, with uh, allegations of uh, babies genetically malformed uh, as a consequence of a, uh, exposure to uh, agents. Um, the, uh, right now, uh, before I get into the detail of uh, chlorine, uh, the OPCW uh, for the past two weeks uh, had eight inspectors uh, on site to investigate the chlorine and last Monday they've uh, added uh, another <coughs> five. Uh, they have received access uh, to the site under uh, control by the Syrian uh, government, but not to uh, sites under the control by the insurgents and uh, it is my understanding that all negotiations for access to rebel sites uh, go through uh, the UN office headed by uh, Brahimi, however since his uh, resignation it means uh, some complication, the office still exists but the political weight uh, that can uh, be put on the insurgents of course is uh, severely uh, affected by that. So, uh, in terms of uh, the chlorine, where do we get? Well, there are th essentially three areas, uh, three sites uh, in Syria, Kefirzita, uh, Al-Telmans and Al-Taman uh, that seem to be uh, affected. And if I look at uh, some of uh, the footage, uh, one does get uh, the impression that uh, people were exposed to something uh, toxic or at least uh, severely irritating. However, what, again, is very difficult to say. If I compare some of the descriptions to first-hand descriptions of chlorine victims uh, in uh, the First World War, things do not always add up unless one uh, accepts uh, that those people were exposed to relatively low doses uh, of the agent so that we are much more in uh, the face of uh, irritations. Um, however, uh, I, I do have a number of questions with uh, some of uh, the pictures uh, we're seeing. First of all, the alleged containers, whether inside the drum or, or, or not, uh, I have no sense whatsoever of their size. Uh, you see pictures, but there is never a reference, uh, a referent object whereby you could more or less uh, judge uh, the size. Even some of the pictures are taken by wide-angle lenses, making them much larger than they uh, would be, and of course they quickly disappear uh, in, into the distance, uh, becoming quite tiny in uh, the distance. But there's not even a person standing next to it, ju just to have a, a, a certain idea. Given the size of, of the drums, I expect that uh, the containers would be uh, pretty small. Also, uh, the lettering CL2 uh, marked on it, okay, uh, this is uh, quite possible, but you know, all the white powder that's being sent around Europe and the United States uh, is marked with anthrax, yet it's still powder uh, that's in it, uh, nothing with uh, anthrax, so uh, we, we must uh, be reserved. Then there was the reference to Norinco, uh, the, the Chinese uh, company, and today I've uh, picked up a statement uh, from the company that they actually uh, deny that. And uh, also that the, the label, which is uh, supposedly uh, on those uh, containers, doesn't match their uh, commercial uh, label. So